Again, they are into the introduction, mostly the supervised countries. Um, yeah, we heard a lot of talks about one simulation this week. And uh, for me, that means you have a specific condition that you're interested in. You implement it in uh, engineer quantum devices. And then you simulate properties like anybody else. <coughs> So you can think about how much online learning is kind of the inverse problem. So given you have an experiment and you have data from, from the quantum simulation, can you learn back the Hamiltonian from this? Like the Hamiltonian structure and its couple of branches. And this is a concept which is actually not still teamwork. So this is a concept which is well developed for lab systems. So and here I take the example of uh, an iron trap. It's actually the iron trap of Cliff and Lewis in his book. And um, so that's the first ingredient that you have to actually form the system. And then there's the second ingredient, which is an unsatisfied Hamiltonian, which you combine in a classic optimization process. And so if you want to learn something about the Hamiltonian, so the state of these individual ions here, it, it is better determined by the Hamiltonian, so that means you can learn it in different settings. Uh, you could look at quench dynamics, you know, because the Hamiltonian generates the time evolution. But you could also look at steady states, which are determined by the Hamiltonian, like thermal if states or ion states. And then here you can uh, address all of these ions individually and kind of look at all of these correlation functions. So say you have that, that brings us to a second ingredient. Uh, it's a local handbox. Local means you couple here, local Hamiltonian hyperspace. And um, this makes sure that it's an actually efficient problem, yeah, if you want to later on optimize it, because there's only a polynomial number of uh, these objects uh, for a physical system. So here I illustrated for a thermal system that would lead to a set of correlation constraints. So basically, if you commute the Hamiltonian with an observable O, an expectation value of the thermal state at zero, so that leads to this uh, linear combination of operators here. And um, you can optimize for the G to actually make this sum up to zero, and therefore find the optimal parameters uh, for your system Hamiltonian. So this actually, um, for this specific case of um, um, the sign chain, there's broken progress in his book where, where you can see that you can nicely reconstruct these and the action matrix of, uh, of these things. And basically, once I've optimized the coupling, you can plot them like in here. You get a number which somehow quantifies how well you're doing, how well the standards works for um, describing the system. And let me use the opportunity to also advertise some other recent work in Innsbruck so you can extend this uh, story to the millions um, because it's very valuable to, to be able to characterize also the incoherent errors in such a setting. And furthermore, you can learn about more, this, more about the structure of, uh, of quantum systems by. Uh, looking at subsystems over here and learning entanglement Hamiltonians rather than Hamiltonians, uh, yeah, which says about the entanglement structure. So now, how does this go on for actual quantum field theories, which are rel relevant in this uh, um, once you look at uh, continuous quantum systems? And here, the underlying problem is that you have no like fixed microscopic scale. So uh, the question of like what it means to individually address all the microscopic theories in freedom is actually not so well defined and um, we will have to see what that means in a minute. So let me be specific, the example that we have in mind, but I think the method is more general and can be generalized afterwards, is uh, suppose you have a system of cold atoms which can continuously move like an optical potential. And such a system would have to measure a description in terms of a quantum field theory. And here, to be specific, I choose a sine growth model. And you can think of this as a continuous set of uh, oscillators, which are coupled in space, and which has this additional potential here as an anti-unicity, if you wish. So what the experiment then does in the end is, so here you have a continuous uh, variable, which, which is x. And then often they do projected free space measurements onto like, a discrete set of numbers. And um, so here's a problem of scale, um, or here enters this problem of finding what, what is the actual relevant microscopic scale. 
Yeah, so then you kind of draw it like this as an arrow here in terms of A versus N. And then here the highest scale is somehow the, the color field infinity. So the smallest sensible uh, spatial scale to think about in infinity. Then there are physical scales, so just mass gaps in such a problem. And overall, there's also system size scales. And then what the uh, experiment does, and the measurement does, is it introduces this additional scale, which is measurement. And it kind of separates these uh, scales into ellipsoidal group ones, which are the ones at the right, and uh, the ones we can access. So the problem that we face is here if I uh, choose a local answer, so the field theory lives over here at lambda, uh, but what we can actually learn is uh, only information that lives at the uh, measurement scale over here. So what we're doing is we're kind of bridging the gap between these two in order to get a sense of field theory and sets an effective concept, uh, which describes the uh, degrees of freedom and the interactions at the scale of the chemical formation. So <clears throat> what we do is we, uh, we do the step analytical here. So basically, uh, we find an effective chemotone, which has uh, similar ingredients. However, the effect of the inobservable degrees of freedom is actually uh, a change in the effective interaction of uh, these effective average fields that uh, live exactly at, at, at these points where you perform the measurements. Yeah? And uh, the second step is that we have this uh, kind of difference operator over here, which is the case in space, uh, which uh, takes the role of, of derivative operators, which, of course, in the discrete settings uh, don't, don't have a well defined meaning. So that um, sets the stage for the overall workflow of, of this protocol. So um, we think about a continuous quantum system in the beginning, and here we will be working with uh, the experiment of Hirsch Lima that is in uh, Vienna. And uh, so here the idea is that they can extract a set of correlation functions at these discrete um, points in space. And then, as I just described, we um, start from, from an ansatz field theory, uh, we derive the effective theory, and then, as in the beginning, derive a set of uh, combination constraints. So ultimately, all of this comes uh, down to a class continuization problem. So here you see an example, an analytical um, example of how this constraint landscape might look like. Uh, here for the input data of the free point field theory. And uh, you see that the screen minimum here nicely coincides with this white dot, which is um, the Hamiltonian that we uh, use to calculate the input data. So you can read the scheme from left to right, which would be a Hamiltonian learning procedure. You start from the data and get a set of uh, coupling parameters over here. And um, conversely, you can also see it as a verification step. So uh, given a set of uh, constraints over here, you can find the minimum value of the constraint. And then going back, it gives you, uh, well, a verification to, to what degree this, this platform actually serves as a quantum simulator of the QFT. So with that, I come to the experimental results on, on this uh, slide over here. So, um, yeah, as I said, the experiment by um, Jörg Schmidmeier, so what they have is they have this uh, tunnel um, potential over here, and they have uh, two clouds of ultracold atoms, which are in the cigar shape, and they can interact by turning in through this barrier. And uh, these superfluids, um, they have actually been shown to realize this uh, sign Gordon theory in a uh, classical statistical limit that we um, focus on. And um, so basically what they do is they let them interfere, and then you get these snapshots of data over here, where you can define the relative phase, which will be the relevant degree of freedom in this case. And um, exactly as described before, you can uh, make these correlation functions, which will be the input data for our uh, uh, analysis. And uh, to show that we're actually able to distinguish this, uh, sign Gordon theory from other um, possible potentials. We are looking at three different ones. So we have a potential here, which for any plus one is exactly the sign Gordon case. For higher ends, it will be um, higher harmonics, uh, expansions of that. And um, so what we can do is we can look again at the constraint landscape. So actually here we do a chi-square test to see uh, to what degree um, the constraint is statistically 
in agreement with zero. And you see we have this nice ellipsis over here, um, which uh, also nicely agrees with um, well, the last estimate from, from the field numerical simulation of the experiment. So here's a technical detail. Actually, here we have two sets of correlate um, resolution scales, um, just uh, from how the experiment is built. And it's important that some of both of them are uh, larger than these resolution scales, such as um, our previous construction that the effective theory um, holds. And that's actually what changes once we go to uh, these higher harmonics of, uh, of the potential. So you see it, it moves more to the left, and also this region um, where the agreement is nice dissolves a bit. And uh, for Henry uh, three that we that we see that in, in, in this part where we would expect the uh, and that's the whole this uh, no good agreement anymore. Yeah, so with that, uh, we could kind of confirm that um, uh, the Hamiltonian is indeed um, somehow consistent with the Saigon theory for the input data that we have. So with this, let me briefly uh, thank my um, the people involved, both in Innsbruck and in Vienna, and um, have a few short conclusions. So first, um, I think we have a scheme here to, to somehow plot the emergence of field theories uh, in a more general scale um, setting, also uh, with dependence of scale, so that we synchronize in future experiments to somehow uh, tune the resolution scales and um, see how different theories can emerge uh, for different resolutions. So, of course, we would like to a uh, little bit more into experiments. So here, this was uh, for one temperature, and um, for yeah, one set of data. We basically would be interesting to look at this for different uh, temperatures and also for crunch dynamics. And within a certain energy range, so all of these would yield the same chromatogram because this is somehow uh, where all of um, these states are derived from. So that this would be a very important cross check for analog quantum simulation uh, in general. I think. So I think our methods also more generally could be applied to lattice systems, maybe not along the microscopic Hamiltonian of individual spins, but maybe more emergent, more effective theory at longer distance scales. And I think this would be a first step towards the question how we could access uh, randomization loop flows uh, from quantum simulation experiments. Thank you. 